Let's pray together. Lord, I think of the Scripture that says, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Lord, to you be glory. To you be honor and power. Touch our hearts today with your Spirit. May this be a visit with you in the garden as we open the Bible. Convict us of our sins. Reveal the righteousness of Christ to us. Change our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Over the past several weeks, I've been attempting to speak when I preach about the essence of true worship. I'm delighted. Uh, Pastor Diego and I don't always get to have deep conversations uh, about our sermons. When we have our meetings, we have a number of things to cover, but it's just been a delight to see how complimentary um, his messages have been. It's like uh, the Holy Spirit has put us on the same wavelength, and uh, I hope that you sense that same thing as, uh, as we share God's Word that he lays upon our hearts. But on this subject of true worship, I believe the reason this is such a vital and important issue that we really discern and focus on what the Bible means when it calls us to worship, it's really found in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 14. In the book of Revelation, it is almost as if all the books of the Bible meet and end. It's, it's kind of a concentrated complimentary summary of the message of the entire Bible. It's like God really amplifies the entire message of the Bible, at least for me as I read the book of Revelation. Do any of the rest of you notice that as you read God's Word in, in his book of Revelation? Well, I'm thinking especially of chapter 14 and verse 14 to introduce today's topic. John says, Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, that's Jesus, having on his head a golden crown, crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. And verse 15 says, And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud. Isn't that interesting? An angel uh, says this to Jesus, Thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is what? It's ripe. Oh, this is a prophetic depiction, no doubt, of the second coming of Jesus Christ. And according to verse 15, think with me, according to verse 15, we have lots of other signs we like to point to in the Scripture. One of my favorite is Matthew 24, 14. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness to all nations. And then what? The end shall come. There are numerous other events that we as students of Bible prophecy, and rightly so, like to point to, to point out that the coming of Jesus is near. But may I point out one that sometimes perhaps we don't think about enough that we ought to think about? It's this verse. When will he come according to this verse? When what? When the harvest of the earth is ripe. That's when Jesus is coming back. Amen? Now, the question then is, what is the harvest? Now, Jesus used agriculture many times in his parables and his teaching to illustrate the effect of the gospel seed of truth. The effect of the gospel when it's planted in dead soil. The hearts of men and women, boys and girls, that are dead in trespasses and sins, the Bible says in the book of Ephesians. But according to the life that is in the seed of the Word of God, gospel truth bears fruit and brings life to the believer who receives the gospel of Jesus Christ, who receives Christ as their personal Savior through the Word of God. Now, the ripening of the harvest, then, portrays the reception of the gospel by people on this earth so they will be prepared for the second coming. Now, friends, that's true in every generation. Because even people who have died to be ready for the second coming and the resurrection, they must receive the gospel and respond to the gospel, right? Okay, so this is true in every generation. There are some unique things about God's final proclamation of the gospel we'll consider this morning, but this is true in every generation. Now, it is of great interest to me that just a few verses before this picture of Jesus' return in the clouds of glory we have the everlasting gospel. I love that phrase, don't you? That one phrase alone assures me there's only one gospel in the Bible. There's only one, there only is and always was only one way to be saved. 
From Adam to the last person saved, it's the everlasting gospel is the only method the Bible reveals, right? Praise the Lord. That's good news, isn't it? It's not complicated. We don't have a God who has five or six or seven different plans to save mankind. He has one. He has one, right? So this everlasting gospel is being proclaimed. Let's read the verses. This is at the heart of our movement. Revelation 14, 6 through 12 is, our, is the core of who we are, right? Now, I don't know about you, I can never get enough of this message. I want to live and breathe this message. This is how God wants the gospel proclaimed in the last days. Same gospel, but there are some unique emphases in the last days to his gospel that I want to live and breathe. How about you? I want to cooperate with the Lord in the way how, in in the way that he specifically wants his everlasting gospel to be proclaimed. So, I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Well, listen, I can't resist this. In a day where there's so much turmoil and sad to say over race, isn't it wonderful to know that the religion of Jesus, the religion of the gospel, is not unique to Western man, is it? Not at all. His gospel is to go to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people right? Let's never forget that. Continuing in verse 7, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth and springs of water. Now the harvest will not come, friends. This harvest will not come until this message of the gospel with the warnings go to every tribe, tongue, and people. I'm going I'm to just repeat that again, okay? There are sincere people all over this world who know Jesus and love him, but they do not understand and they are not yet obedient to the warning messages in the last gospel proclamation. And Jesus will not come until everyone has had the opportunity to hear these unique emphases of the everlasting gospel, the warning messages associated with the everlasting gospel, he's not coming until that work is complete. Are you with me, folks? It's very important that we see that. Otherwise, why do we exist? We have no reason to be a separate denomination, all right? Now, there are actually two more warnings besides the warning given in this message, but we're not going to take time for that today. Um, I'm sure we'll be covering that in, in future talks but not necessarily this series that I'm in right now. But I want you to notice that according to verse 7, this warning message, the hour of God's judgment comes before the second coming. That's not widely believed among Christians. You are aware of that, I hope, okay? So if you want to be studious and be able to talk intelligently and reasonably about the unique uh, facets of our faith which I believe are vitally important, this would be something to spend some serious time on, okay? Uh, The judgment hour comes before the second coming of Jesus Christ. Christ himself, in the book of Revelation, makes this very clear later in the book before he returns. Please notice chapter 22, verse 12. And behold, Jesus says, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. So you see, friends, judgment has to transpire before his return to determine the rewards of mankind, right? That's just a classic approach that even our pioneers, that would be a pivotal text that they would use in support of this, and it's very clear from the Word of God. Now, Revelation 14, 6, once again. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every tribe, tongue, and people. Notice this angel that proclaims the everlasting gospel in verse 6 is not a literal angel. I know it gets confusing sometimes discerning between the literal and the symbolic in the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel. But I would venture to say I would be on safe ground if when a prophet is in vision, Most of the things that they see are symbolic. Most of the things they see are symbolic. 
if almost everything is symbolic, okay? However, there's a literal application to the symbols that they're looking at. So we needn't get caught up in the speculative, strange ideas that float around sometimes. If you, if you start emphasizing the symbolic nature of prophecy, people come up with some really wild ideas, and we don't want to do that. But neither do we want to over-literalize Scripture either, okay? So I'm just going to encourage you. Here's a Sabbath afternoon study for you. If you've not wrestled with that idea before, how do I know that that's not a literal angel? How do I know there's not going to be an angel someday appear in the sky shouting to the whole world God's message? Well, has God worked that way in the past? No. Um, now, when Jesus was born, there were some angels. To those that were willing to receive it, they sang his praises. But Jesus didn't say, I've committed the, commi the gospel commission to angels, did he? He didn't give that work to angels. They'd, they'd probably do a better job than we would. <laughs> They're unfallen, right? But the privilege is given to us. But more importantly, just read Revelation chapters 1 and 2 very carefully with the question, who are the angels of the seven churches? Okay? That will help you discern and understand why I would say with boldness and clarity that Revelation, the angel of Revelation 14 proclaiming the everlasting gospel is not a literal angel. No doubt they're involved, but that's not what John is talking about. Let's move on. So if you allow the Bible to define each of these words in verse 7, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Those three phrases or words, fear God, give him glory, worship him. I'm going to submit to you that after quite a bit of study on this, those essentially mean the same thing. And there might be little nuances that we might emphasize, and I often do myself, in portraying the nature of true worship, giving a little more emphasis to, the, to some of those phrases. But in essence, they're all dealing with the same thing, the nature of true worship, really. So apparently, just before the return of Jesus, the whole world will have forgotten the essence of true worship, and they will need to be reminded. Now, there's an important historical reason for that I don't have time to get in today, but the Bible predicted for over a thousand years there would be a devastating apostasy sweep over the world and corrupt Christianity. That's primarily why this message needs to be proclaimed. God wanted to return the church to its roots of the pure gospel. So he's going to do that, and he's going to do that, is doing that, has been doing that for some time in these messages of Revelation 14. Now, it is not, however, the reason this reminder needs to take place. It is not because there's an absence of religion. Not at all. It is not because there's an absence of religion that God gives these loving, warning messages. Paul warned Timothy that one of the specific signs of the last days would be people having this following experience in 2 Timothy 3, 5. And he specifically mentions this. In the last days, he tells Timothy, this is what's going to happen. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. And from such people, turn away. Now, we need, to, we need to let that sink in. The warning messages come not because there's an absence of religion. There is a misunderstanding as to the nature of what true religion and true worship is. Before, um, yeah, I lost my train of thought. I'm back now. Okay, so these people that have the forms of worship but deny the power of godliness, the power of godliness that's missing. Godliness, let's talk about this a moment. Godliness is godlikeness. Not in nature, but in character. That's the message of the Bible. When it says we were made in God's image, oh, I, I, I would grant clearly there are, there's resemblance, a physical resemblance to the image of God, but the great emphasis of Scripture in the plan of redemption is not about appearance, not at all. It's about the heart. It's about the character, the image of God. God is love. We were made in the image of God's love. That's the great emphasis of Scripture. So you see, true worship then, those that deny the power of godliness, the problem with them is they deny this reality of the plan of redemption. The plan of redemption is to restore the character of God in humanity. It's to restore the image of God in man. That's, that's God's plan in the plan of salvation. 
The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to bring about this miraculous transformation of character, to restore that image that was almost obliterated, seriously damaged, almost obliterated, the image of God in man, the image of his love. The gospel is to restore that. Now, that before we assume that this last day's form of godliness does not include professed Christians, here's where it gets really sticky. There are many, many, many believers today would grant me that, say, oh, hey, Mike, I, I'm with you. You're right. There's all kinds of corrupt religion in the world that turns people away from the gospel of Jesus. That's what Paul's talking about. I don't think I could agree with that. And the reason I can't agree with that is because of the words of my Lord Jesus. In Matthew chapter 7, notice with me. Matthew 7, he said, many will say to me in that day, and he's talking about the end, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? Does this sound like a people who at least think they know Jesus? It sure does to me. I don't see any way around that. But notice the next verse. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Well, apparently in the day of final reckoning, there'll be many people who will be absolutely confident that they know Jesus as Savior and Lord and think they are saved, but in reality, they will be lost. That is a hard truth to accept from Scripture. But I, based on the simple words of Jesus, to me, it's, it's undeniable. This is why, then, friends, the gospel is given in the context of a warning in the last days. The Lord desires all men to be saved. Christ died for all, right? He's the atoning sacrifice not only for our sins, but the sins of the whole world. He loves every person, and he's so desperate to have them saved, he's willing to go to any length to get their attention and wake them up. And so he gives stern warnings in Scripture to disturb the conscience to wake up people that are spiritually asleep. Now, after years of study about true worship, and I do not profess to be an expert on this, but that's my passion. I want to know what true worship is, and I want to experience it. How about you, friends? All right? So after years of my study on this, I have been delighted to find this quotation that I keep sharing with you that's really inspired this series by William Temple. So let me return to it again. To worship... And the reason I love this so much is I really believe he has, has summarized so succinctly and powerfully all the elements of true worship that the Bible addresses in such a short paragraph. It's just wonderful. To worship is to quicken the conscience by the holiness of God, to feed the mind with the truth of God, to purge the imagination by the beauty of God, to open the heart to the love of God, and devote the will to the purpose of God. So we're going to return to what he said in that little paragraph, to open your heart to the love of God. This is part two of that. So in part one, we notice that when a person believes in Jesus and is forgiven, something happens inside of them, in their heart. Romans chapter 5, verse 5 says, hope does not disappoint. This is a person who believes and is forgiven. Because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given to us. Isn't that a glorious truth? Salvation is intensely practical. It is an experience. It is not just legal fiction that happens in our behalf. Our hearts are changed when the Spirit of Christ comes into our life. We saw that the Spirit of Christ is... is um, we saw that... The Spirit of Christ is for us as believers the very presence of Christ himself. He is Christ's representative. Christ physically cannot be everywhere at once, but he promised that he would come to us through the Spirit, and he does when we're born again. We also saw that the evidence that we have Christ and the salvation that he promised we find in 1 John 3, verse 14. Here is biblical assurance. We know that we have passed from death to life. Why? Because we love the brethren. It's not because we made a profession, friends. It's because the supernatural love of God 
has been evident in our life. We can't create love. It's divine. But where it is functioning, there Jesus is, and there we have salvation. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Shocking, isn't it? Well, today I want to consider with you a relationship between two very, very vital biblical concepts. They belong together, but Satan has worked very hard to divide them. And those two concepts are truth and love. Truth and love. They belong together. They belong together in perfect harmony. They are not in contradiction to one another. But Satan and the world largely today challenges that concept. Stay with me today. So I think I can safely say that most religions in the world believe that love is the goal of true religion. There are some exceptions, okay? But for the most part, all the major world religions, can you think of anyone in the Far East or the Near East that would deny that love is part of what true religion is about? Can you see any major religion that you can think of today denying that? I'm not talking to just Christian religions. I'm talking about pagan religions as well. Now, stay with me. This, to me, this gets very interesting. This is why some believe that all religion is the same. Surely you've heard that statement before, haven't you? It goes like this. Uh, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as in the end you love God and love others. Have you heard that before or something similar? Now, there are things about that statement that have a ring to it that I like. How about you? And I think are scriptural as well. But notice... That sentence summarizes well what I am going to unpack today, God helping me, from the Word of God. It doesn't matter what you believe as long as in the end you love God and love others. The second phrase of that sentence is true. The second phrase is true. Love God, love others. Based on the authority of the Word, on the, on, on the word of God, anyone, just like our text this morning, Cornelius, Cornelius, everyone that fears God and works righteousness is accepted with him. That's just using another word for love. Cornelius in Acts 10 loved God. His knowledge was limited, and God had more truth he had to reveal to him. But he did love God, and he did love others as well, didn't he? He was part of the family of God, friends, okay? It's important that we see that. But it's also important that we see something else. The first phrase is a lie. The first phrase is a lie. Now, before you jump to conclusions, if that disturbs you, okay, the reason, the reason it, it may cause some people to be a bit shaken up is just like Cornelius, do any of us have a perfect knowledge of all truth? Of course not. It doesn't have what the Bible is dealing with. It's the truth that he reveals to us. It's the opportunities and privileges that God gives us to know truth that we are accountable for. Okay, that's what I'm talking about today, and that's what the Bible is dealing with. So it's actually a very dangerous idea to suggest it doesn't matter what you believe. Now let me share with you why. If what you believe doesn't matter, then it becomes impossible to define what love is. Let me repeat that. If what you believe doesn't matter, try and define love. It doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter. If nothing matters, if what you believe doesn't matter, then your definition of love doesn't matter. Let me introduce you to someone that is, has been called the most wicked person on earth. Alistair Crowley. Everybody heard of this guy's name? Beatles even sang about him at one time. Mr. Crowley, in one of their songs. Alistair Crowley. Do you believe that this man is the founder of a thematic religion an occult religion, and the primary value that he wrote about was, guess what? Love. Of course. Satan knows what the heart of true religion is. Love. Crowley was focusing on love. Let me read about Crowley just a little bit here, some facts that are of great interest. He lived from 1875 to 1947. He was an English occultist, ceremonial magician, a poet, a painter, novelist, and a mountaineer. He founded the religion of Thelema, an occult religion. The book of the law is the central sacred text of the religion of Thelema. Allegedly, this was written down 
from dictation. Have you ever heard of automatic writing? This is quite similar. Dictation by Aleister Crowley. Crowley claimed it was depicted to him, this message in the book, by a supernatural being calling himself Iowas. But some chapters are largely written in the first person by the Thelemic deities Nuit, Hadit, and Re Hor Kuit, respectively. Wow, what names. So through the reception of the book, Crowley proclaimed the arrival of a new stage in the spiritual evolution of humanity to be known as the Eon of Horus. The primary precept of this new eon is a charge to, get this, this is the whole of the law, according to Crowley and his demonic inspiration, do what thou wilt. Do what you want. You ever heard the phrase, do your own thing? You know, that's kind of old now. That's in essence it. Here are some of the book's expansions. If that doesn't disturb you, this should. Here are some of the book's expansions of this principle. Crowley was bisexual, but he exhibited a sexual preference for women. Now, let me back up. I'm going to read his quotation here. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. All questions of the law are to be decided only by appeal to my writings, each for himself. There is no law beyond do what thou wilt. But notice, love is the law. Isn't that fascinating? Love is the law, love under will. Take your will and fill of love as you will, when, where, and with whom ye will. Does that sound like the love of the Bible to you? And yet he's using a biblical term and redefining and reorienting the meaning of love. Be aware, friends, this goes on numerous times uh, in the name of Christian theology sometimes too, sad to say. But Crowley himself was bisexual. He exhibited a preference, however, for women, with his relationships with women being fewer, and they were clustered mostly in the early part of his life. In particular, he had an attraction toward exotic women, and he claimed to have fallen in love on multiple occasions. Of course, that was with different women. And one writer stated, and he was married too, by the way, one writer stated that, quote, when he loved, he did so with his whole being. But the passion was typically short-lived. Well, you know what? I'm glad the writer included the appropriate word the second time. The first word, love, does not belong in that sentence. Passion does. They are not one and the same thing. Amen? Now, even later in life, Crowley was able to attract young Bohemian women to be his lovers. Wow, well, there's an older man while he's an older man, and largely this was due to his charisma. He applied the term scarlet woman to various female lovers whom he believed played an important role in his magical work. Remember, he's an occult teacher. An underlying theme in many of his writings is that, get this, that spiritual enlightenment arises through transgressing social sexual norms. Really? So the more decadent and perverted you can be in your sexuality, it's going to give you more spiritual power. Fascinating, isn't it? Now, Crowley advocated complete sexual freedom for both men and women. He argued that homosexual and bisexual people should not suppress their sexual orientation. My friends, I'm just going to hit it right on the head. How shocking that such proclamations would be made from the pulpits of Christian churches today. It's satanic is what it is. Let's call it for what it is. That homosexual and bisexual people should not suppress their sexual orientation. That is a satanic idea. Commenting that a person must not be ashamed or afraid of being homosexual if he happens to be so at heart. He must not attempt to violate his own true nature because of public opinion or medieval morality or religious prejudice which would wish he were otherwise. My friends, the occult under satanic power has marched right into the Christian church. It has, we are witnessing this. Now, I've probably said enough about Aleister Crowley, but you see the point, right? Now, brace yourself, because I'm going to say it again. 
Those Christians who have embraced and promote the idea that LGBTQ lifestyle plus can harmonize with Scripture and meet his approval are more in harmony with Crowley and Satan than they are with Scripture. Satan's masterpiece of deception is to combine darkness with light, to bring spiritualism and the occult right into the Christian church, and he is largely succeeding right now. How? Crowley illustrated for us by simply redefining what love is. Instead of accepting God's explanation, God's exposition, God's revelation of what true love is in Christ and in the Bible, mankind, under the influence of Satan, chooses another definition. Now, hear me carefully, because I can easily be, be misunderstood in saying a very strong statement like that. So please, if, if, I'm, if you're angry at me right now for saying that, please listen carefully because I have some unpacking to do in making a bold statement like that. It is true, absolutely true, that it is unloving and it is unchristian to mistreat in any way any person that identifies as LGBTQ+. That is unchristian and it is unloving, it is ungodly. Mistreating anyone, no matter how minor you think the wisecrack or joke might be, that's ungodly, it's sinful, and it's unchristian. Are you with me? It's important that we say that. Why? Because God says that's not the nature of love. In 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4, notice, love is patient, love is kind to everyone, to people that you vehemently disagree with, to people whose lifestyle you totally reject and you've, you know based on the Word of God it is aberrant. You by the grace of God in you and the love of God in you, are to treat every person, no matter how decadent you see their lifestyle as being, kindness is how they're to be treated. Amen? Right. Love does not envy, does not boast, it is not proud. Now notice here, it is not rude. A real Christian is not going to be rude to anyone. Even to people who are in abject, open rebellion against God, we will not be rude because of the love of Christ. Right, church? Amen. Now, because LGBTQ plus people have been mistreated by professed Christians, undoubtedly this is true, okay? If we're not careful, we can swing to the other ditch in our sympathy for their mistreatment and end up approving and affirming their sinful practices in the name of what? In the name of love. In the name of love. This is very confusing territory, friends, and I have a feeling it's much more deeply rooted among us as Christian believers than we might want to admit. It's dangerous to go there, okay? Why would I say that? Because the same passage where God unpacks through the Apostle Paul a beautiful expression of the definition of love, notice what the Bible says. Love does not delight in evil. You see, love loves people, but it will not endorse, condone, or approve of evil practices. That's cutting it pretty, pretty tight between two, two things, isn't it? So easy for us to be either or. Well, either you don't like someone because you don't approve of their practices, or you like them and you approve of their practices. The Bible knows nothing of that language. You love people in spite of their practices, but you love them enough not only to embrace them as a person, and treat them kindly, but you love them enough to tell the truth in a loving way, right? It rejoices with the truth. It cannot rejoice in a lie because the lies the devil tells people is you'll find your ultimate fulfillment, your ultimate happiness in being who you are inside already. The Bible says we're all born with corruption. We're all born with temptations that are perverted and twisted. So lest you think that I'm exalting LGBTQ plus practices as more sinful than others, I'm not going there. I don't believe that at all. The worst sin of all is pride and self-sufficiency, right? That's the real problem. But I, I'm going here because this is an illustration of the deceptive nature of redefining love and where it takes us, not in just this area, but many others. So watch this. With Crowley's definition of love, 
Crowley himself would, I'm quite convinced, if he were alive today, he would have no problem whatsoever if I read this scripture to him, 1 John 4, both these verses, and I said, Mr. Crowley, the Bible says he who does not love does not know God, for God is love. It also says, and we've known and believed that the love that God has for us, God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. You see, Crowley could look at it and say, great, I believe that too, couldn't he? How could he do that? Because he would be reading the word love under his own definition and explanation and understanding of what love is. But here's the problem. What you believe about love determines how you love. What you believe about love determines how you will love. And the problem is that in our sin, we really don't know what love is unless God reveals it to us. That's the only way we can know what love is. And only God knows what love is, for God is love. Therefore, only he can define it for us. What a stark contrast there is, friends. Stark contrast between the prayer of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane and the supposed truth of the book of the law. Jesus prayed in Luke chapter 40, 22, verse 42, extreme pressure to yield to what he, knew, what he knew the plan of the Father was, to yield that, the pressure was so intense upon him to turn away from the cup that he was drinking and give it up. But what did he pray? Not my will, but yours be done. Let me read Crowley again to you. Crowley's occult definition says that love does demand its own way. Not your will, but my will be done. And this insistence on one's own way, friends, began in heaven. This is what started the war in heaven, isn't it? Satan insisted on his own way. He turned away from love and produced what he called love, but it was rebellion and selfishness. Now, it shouldn't surprise us that he would try to champion this very same idea in the world, but I'm going to say especially in the church. It shouldn't surprise us that he would work so hard in the church. I mean, he lived in heaven next to God, and he started it there. Why should it surprise us that in the, in the professed Christian church of Jesus Christ, that would be an area of supreme interest for him to introduce this principle and call it love. Consider William Temple's statement again. Without God's love, uh, I'm sorry, to worship is to open the heart to the love of God. I'm just focusing on that phrase right now. To open the heart to the love of God. That's what true worship is. So without God's love in our hearts, we do not worship and we cannot worship unless we experience his love being imparted to us through the Spirit as a gift of his grace. Amen? So, while it is true, this is, this is vital, while it's true that love is a gift from God, we must have the truth of God from Scripture to know what it is and how it truly operates because, my friends, we are still, even though converted, prone to spiritual blindness and delusion. That's where truth comes in. Truth, truth is the protector of love. Truth is the protector of love. And more than our spiritual blindness, there's a deeper problem that makes us extreme. Our spiritual blindness makes us susceptible to the deeper problem. And that's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14. Satan himself transforms himself into what? An angel of light. Now, Satan will someday appear, literally. I believe this. Um, in my study of Scripture, I believe that he will appear physically, literally, and the world will think it's Jesus. And many professed Christians will think it's Jesus. And the primary reason they're going to think it's Jesus is because they have already believed his other lies for many years, lies that have been clothed with angel robes. Now here's... Um, 
his specialty is making evil look good and good look evil. That's his specialty. And that's why most people will think that he is Christ when Satan appears because they've already accepted his other lies. My appeal to you today, friends, is will you allow God to define what love is by the Bible and the life of Jesus? Or will you choose your own or the world's definition of what real love is? That's the challenge we face today, friends. Make no mistake about it. Do you see it in our world today? Do you see it in the church today? That's the issue. Does God get to define love, or do you get to define it? By feeling, by reason, by logic, by education, by the professionals? Or will you believe the naked Word of God and the teachings of the Spirit as you open the Bible and allow Him to portray what real love is? Let's pray together. Fathers, we confess our weakness and inability to see things in the spiritual realm. It's to your great mercy that we appeal. Your word says that you were rich to, toward all who call upon you. And we call upon you today, Lord. Needy? Spiritually blind in ourselves? Susceptible to many professional and twisted arguments that Satan himself has engineered. Oh, God, save us that we may know the truth as it is in Jesus. And may we experience the true love that is portrayed, described, and promised in Christ and in the Bible. Forgive us of allowing the world so powerfully to influence our reasoning when it comes to sensitive spiritual matters about love. Apply the eye salve that we may see, Lord Jesus. We pray in your name.